Hey, good morning, y'all. Welcome to the Valley Labor Report. My name is Adam Keller, and this is Shop Talk. Appreciate y'all joining me this morning, or whenever you're listening. I uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, excited about today's episode. I apologize. It's a little bit later than normal. Uh, we try to stick to the 9.30 time slot, but I worked an 18-hour shift yesterday and uh, overslept this morning, so it is what it is. Today is April 20th, and we're broadcasting live from Spice Radio Studio in the heart of the Tennessee Valley here in Huntsville, Alabama. This is Shop Talk, which is our Thursday episode focused on labor education, history, and training. Every episode is live streamed on YouTube and Facebook and is released on your favorite podcasting platform in the coming days. Today on the show, it's a history episode with an examination of American involvement in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, This is a favorite topic of mine, so I wanted to bust this out. We've done some training uh, last week on Shop Talk, so I wanted to switch gears back to history, uh, and this is one of my favorite subjects in history. Just a reminder that the Valley Labor Report is a working class media collective dedicated to lifting up labor struggles throughout Alabama and across the South. We bring you Alabama's only union talk radio show every Saturday morning with the first half from 9.30 to 11 a.m. live on FM radio through WVNN here in the Huntsville listening area. The entire program is online via Facebook, YouTube, and podcast. And portions of the program are replayed on WZZA in the Shoals and WHIV out of New Orleans. We encourage you to check out our website, tvlr.fm, which we are currently expanding to feature published articles, including news and commentary relevant to working people. Uh, We're putting out new content nearly every day. Uh, You can sign up for our newsletter. Just give us your email and you can choose if you want a daily newsletter or a weekly newsletter. Uh, so you can stay tuned to all the new content. And while you're on the website, go over to tvlr.fm slash store. Uh, You can check out our merch. We have some really cool shirts that are uh, supposed to be coming in here in the next couple weeks, so uh, you definitely want to get your hands on one of those. And finally, we rely on donations and sponsorships to put out all of this free content. We appreciate the local unions and organizations that have sponsored ads on our main Saturday show. Uh, We are looking for sponsors for Overtime and Shop Talk. I'm excited that we are uh, looking, it looks like we're gonna have our very first sponsor of Shop Talk starting in May. Uh, Really excited about that, looking forward to it. Uh, But we do need a couple more sponsors to sustain the series for the long haul. So uh, unions and allied organizations, other media outlets, union print shops and vendors, publishers, anyone who might be interested in reaching an audience of union activists and allies concentrated in the South. Please hit us up if you have any ideas for sponsors or if you're interested in your organization becoming a sponsor. Our single biggest source of contributions comes from listener donations. You can make a one-time donation or a recurring contribution at tvlr.fm slash donate. We also have a Patreon if you prefer to donate that way, and we'll still take a good old-fashioned check mailed to our P.O. box. Whether you donate, share, subscribe, or just listen, we appreciate your support, and we can't do it without you. We put out all this content for free because we are dedicated to growing the Southern labor movement. And if you share this mission... Please support however you can so we can have media that is by, for, and of the working class. So, as I mentioned, this is going to be a labor history episode. Um, Really, I'm I'm glad to do this episode. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a little tired today. It was a long day yesterday working with my IATSE sisters and brothers uh, at the VBC Arena for uh, 18 hours. Uh, we helped put on a really cool concert last night. Uh, that's what we do. We're the, we're the labor behind the scenes. And so I uh, wanted to just kind of bust out one of my favorite topics today. 
we've done some some history already on the series. Uh, I opened with an, uh, a look at Walker County teacher strike in 1979. Uh, we had on the great historian Max Frazier, who's an assistant professor over at the University of Miami. Uh, and I have some really cool guests planned over the next few weeks to uh, really ramp up some of the history discussions that we're having on Shop Talk. Uh, and we're also doing training. As I mentioned last week, uh, we looked at the legal rights of union members. We've also uh, examined ways to get involved as a new member. And we're going to have more and more of those training topics as well. So definitely keep your suggestions coming. If you have any ideas, you know, what would you like to learn more about as a union member or an activist? Uh, what kind of training and professional development kind of uh, content would you be interested in? So with all that out of the way, I want to move into our conversation about the American involvement in the Spanish Civil War. And the Spanish Civil War is one of those topics that, you know, a lot of folks aren't familiar with. Uh, people who are highly political uh, and have some sense of history, probably are pretty familiar with it uh, because of the ideological nature of the conflict. And, you know, so I'm wearing my International Brigade shirt today, as you can see. Um, I actually have, that's my only tattoo, is, is the International Brigade emblem. So obviously this is kind of a passion for me. And I hope that that uh, you will walk away learning a little something about this conflict, and in particular, the United States' involvement in the conflict, and really why that's relevant to working class people. Um, I know this may seem a little far from labor union history in the South, uh, but as you'll, you'll hear later, uh, it's absolutely relevant to the type of history discussions we're having on the Valley Labor Report, and, and I believe it's relevant for labor union members, and working class activists today. So the relationship of Americans to the Spanish Civil War was a visible indicator of the social and economic divisions in 1930s America. Generally, American opinions on the Spanish Civil War can be divided into three categories. Pro-Republicans, consisting of the radical intelligentsia and militant sections of the working class, the traditional neutral or isolationist policy, which was held by the government and prevalent in mainstream politics at the time. And finally, those who were sympathetic or even supportive of the nationalists, consisting primarily of Christian extremists and bourgeois elements with fascist tendencies. So today we're going to largely focus on the pro-Republicans, who were most directly and actively involved in the conflict. Uh, and with whom, frankly, I share the most sympathy. However, the effects of official government policy and the actions of the anti-Republicans will also be explored. In addition, the treatment of pro-Republicans after the conflict and what, if any, lasting influence the Spanish Civil War had on American politics and class struggle uh, will be covered. This is a unique topic due to the volunteerism, international solidarity, and radicalism exhibited by the small yet influential group of Americans who crossed the Atlantic to serve in Spain. It's also important to examine the American response and relationship to the conflict in the context of the lead up to World War II. So let's start with a brief introduction to the Spanish Civil War to provide you a little bit of context to the subject at hand. We're gonna look at the United States government policy in reaction to the conflict uh, as well as the effects of that official policy, reactions to the policy, and its evolution throughout the conflict. We're also going to look at public opinion and media coverage of the war. We're also going to look at pro-nationalist elements in the United States of America, including corporate backers of Franco's nationalist forces. Uh, but the most extensive coverage will be afforded to the pro-Republicans, and that includes supports from individuals and organizations in the United States, the Americans who volunteered in Spain, either as a member of the international brigades or not, the motivations of those who volunteered, how the volunteers affected the course of the war, and the treatment of these volunteers after the end of the war. 
Particular attention will be paid to the participation of minorities and the significance of their contributions. Overall, this should provide an overview of the relationship between the United States of America and the Spanish Civil War and how it reflected economic and social divisions within American society at the time. Now, the Spanish Civil War continues to be a divisive subject to this day. Though given little, if any, coverage in history textbooks and classrooms in America, it has been written on extensively by all types of journalists, intellectuals, historians, and others from its very start. Part of the historical appeal is no doubt the many innovations from both military and media standpoints. Additionally, the conflict is significant in the context of the build-up to World War II and its broad geopolitical influence, far exceeding the relative influence of Spain. The complexity of the war's participants, the internationalization of the conflict, and the revolutionary aspects make it particularly unique. In the 1930s, Spain was really struggling to come out of the 19th century. Meanwhile, it was dealing with 20th century ideological conflict. The Second Spanish Republic was declared in 1931 and formally ended the long-running monarchy. The new liberal government was immediately faced with daunting challenges. According to Helen Graham, they saw themselves as the heirs of the 1789 revolution in France and sought to open Spain up to Europe implementing economic and cultural modernization on the French model in four crucial respects. Reform of land ownership, education, state-church relations, and the army. The secular government removed the traditional privileges of the Catholic Church and embraced the campaign of secularization. The government's anti-church policies produced a firestorm storm of controversy. Anti-Catholic sentiments were strong among sections of the population who resented the church's traditional role of upholding the monarchy and the landowning elite. The church responded to what it felt were attacks, with Pope Pius XI stating the laws constitute a new and graver offense not only to religion and the church, but also to those declared principles of civil liberty on which the new Spanish regime declares it bases itself. The new reforms sought by the liberal government angered the traditional elites of the country, along with the conservative elements of the religious. Traditional pro-church, pro-military, and pro-monarchy elements dominated the right wing. The growing fascist movements, such as the Falange, began growing in influence. Keep in mind, in, 19, in the 1920s, I believe it was 1922, when uh, Mussolini took power in Italy, so he had been in power along with his fascist party for several years at this point. Uh, and of course, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis took over Germany in 1933, right? So we have a context of growing fascism throughout Europe. Meanwhile, the new political scene of the Republic had diverse and even radical elements. Social Democrats and moderate socialists were heavily represented with various communist and anarchist organizations exerting influence as well. In addition to religious and class conflict, regional separatism and nationalism added to the clash. And we continue to see separatism as a major issue in Spain even now. Rising tensions, including strikes, assassinations, and political violence were prevalent from the onset of the Republic. The breaking point was the election of 1936. At that point, the Popular Front, a popular tactic of the left at this time, was an electoral co coalition of various left and center-left parties. The National Front competed against the Popular Front. The National Front attempted to re represent the old elite as well as newer fascist elements, all trying to roll back reforms of the Republican government and its left-wing radicalism, real or perceived. With a victory by the Popular Front, army, gen army generals attempted to overthrow the newly elected government. 
The plotting generals hoped for a quick coup d'etat, but the Republican government held on to most of the country, particularly by arming the population. A newly armed population meant that anarchist militias seized power in different parts of the country, especially in Catalonia. Now, the diverse grouping of liberals, socialists, communists, both independent and common turn aligned, anarchists, and separatists had a right-wing rebellion to fight. The conflict was chaotic and bloody from start to finish. Even in Republican zones, the government's reach was often lost. Radical working class and peasant revolutions were occurring, like in anarchist Catalonia, which George Orwell uh, wrote about and visited, of course, at the time. While both the Republicans and the Nationalists consisted of very diverse and even contradictory elements, the Nationalists proved superior in their efforts to unite. General Francisco Franco quickly became head of the Nationalist movement. Meanwhile, Republican forces often lacked coordination and were subject to infighting. The Communist Party of Spain, the PCE, backed by Stalin's Comintern, attempted to solidify control of the Republican movement. As a result, the PCE targeted anarchists and the POUM, who were anti-Stalinist communists affiliated with Trotsky. The Republican infighting reached a new height during the Barcelona May Days, when the PCE engaged in open battle with anarchists and the POUM. International support for the two loosely defined sides in the Civil War became a pivotal issue. The Republican government was assisted by the Soviet Union and Mexico, while the Nationalists were aided by Germany, Italy, and Portugal. The Republic also had the help of the International Brigades, which was created by the Comintern in order to recruit foreign volunteers to fight for the Spanish Republic. Despite desperate appeals, the Spanish government was unable to win over the West. The Western democracies were, reluct were reluctant to risk provoking an expanded war. In addition, the thought of aiding radical revolutionaries was no doubt troublesome among the halls of power. According to Graham, the British had been suspicious of the Republic's reforming nature since its creation in 1931. After all, the memory of 1917 and the wave of revolution that emanated from Russia was still fresh. Britain continued a policy of appeasement and did not want to provoke the rising fascist powers. France, surrounded by Italy and Germany, could not risk upsetting the British. While the West was committed to quote-unquote non-intervention and refusing to sell arms, the fascist powers did not hesitate to aid the nationalist forces. While Portugal, Germany, and Italy had all ostensibly agreed to the non-intervention pact, it was merely an empty gesture that they hoped would appease the West. The Soviet Union was still attempting to align with Western democracies, particularly France, to bolster their security against the fascist threat. However, the Soviets would argue that blatant violation of non-intervention by the fascist powers essentially forced Stalin's hand. As David D. T. Cattell writes, he kept within the provision of international law which allowed for the supplying of arms to the legitimate government in a civil war, though in doing so he violated the non-intervention pact. With allies in Portugal, Italy, and Germany, Franco had the benefit of superior military aid as well as the assistance of Italian and German air forces, along with tens of thousands of troops. Indeed, these three nations had more reason and capacity to intervene than the Soviet Union. In the grand strategy of Italy and Germany for the conquest of Europe, Spain played an important role as a training ground, as a base and as a pincer against France. Again, that's from Cattell. The significant advantage in foreign aid, along with Republican infighting, helped secure a victory for the Nationalist forces. The brutal civil war produced an estimated 500,000 deaths, massive displacement of the population, and atrocities committed. 
by both sides, though in particular on the nationalist side, who was intent on eliminating political enemies. Nationalist victory led to the establishment of General Franco's dictatorship, which persecuted pro-Republicans throughout its decades-long rule. Now, what about the U.S.? What role did the United States play here, now that we've talked a little bit about what the Spanish Civil War was? When the war erupted in 1936, President Franklin Roosevelt championed neutrality and asked for a, quote, moral embargo. The Neutrality Act of 1937 made the embargo legal, applying official neutrality to civil wars. The law also prohibited travel to war zones, clearly intended to put a stop to Americans traveling to Spain. The United States government took similar actions previously when Italy invaded Ethiopia, and there were some African Americans considering volunteering in the conflict. According to Robin D.G. Kelly, potential volunteers were warned that they would be in violation of a federal statute of 1818 governing the enlistment of U.S. citizens in a foreign army. Isolationism and non-intervention were dominant in mainstream American politics during the 1930s. Congress passed a series of neutrality acts during the years preceding World War II. It's particularly noteworthy that in the official policy of neutrality, both sides were considered equal, regardless if they were the aggressor or the victim. There were different views within the government, however. Roosevelt himself exhibited this with his quarantine speech given in 1937. This speech is significant because it recognized the military aggression of the fascist powers and that this expansion would ultimately threaten the United States. Roosevelt declared that peace-loving nations must make a concerted effort in opposition to those violations of treaties and those ignorings of humane instincts which today are creating a state of international anarchy and instability from which there is no escape through mere isolation or neutrality. While stopping short of direct confrontation, the speech did at least acknowledge the threat. However, this acknowledgement did little to affect the government's policy, and the embargo continued for the duration of the conflict. As noted earlier, supplying arms to a legitimate government during a civil war was completely legal under international law. It was the campaign of appeasement, non-intervention, and in America, isolationism, that in effect put aggressor and victim on equal terms. It had the practical effect of preventing Western aid to the legitimate Republican government, while the fascist governments actively aided and participated in the right-wing rebellion. The United States ambassador to Spain at the time, Claude G. Bowers, was very clear on this position. Quote, the non-intervention committee was a shameless sham, cynically dishonest in that Germany and Italy were constantly sending soldiers, planes, tanks, artillery, and ammunition into Spain without an interference or real protest from sig the signatures of the pact. Opinion was bitterly divided amongst politicians and the public on the issue. Many pro-Republicans felt and anti-fascists felt that the neutrality of the United States and the West served the interests of the nationalists and their foreign backers, not the cause of peace. When it became clear that the American government intended to pass the embargo, the nation declared in its editorial at the time that the United States would in effect be taking sides in the Spanish conflict and taking the side of the Spanish militarists. Hitler, and Mussolini against the government chosen by the Spanish people. While the right saw the Soviet Union behind the Republic, it's likely that they were in fact partially responsible for the Republican reliance on Soviet aid. As Antony Beaver notes, appeasement and the Western boycott of the Republic greatly strengthened the power of the Comintern which was able to present itself as the only effective force to combat fascism. Western governments were apprehensive of the radicalism in Spain. After all, revolution was taking place in various parts of the country. Churches being burned, factories being seized, and land being redistributed 
must have been frightening for those demanding the status quo. However, the policy of appeasement made it clear that only the radicals and the Soviet Union were willing to stand up for the Republicans, perhaps making their fears self-fulfilling. Debate continues to this day over what actions the United States and the other Western democracies could have or should have taken in Spain. According to Ambassador Bowers, the president had said we had made a mistake, and one must wonder if things could have been different. American public opinion was divided over the conflict. The international involvement in the war served to increase media coverage and public concern, as did the ideological nature of the war. On one side, it was seen as a battle between traditional Christian culture and atheistic radicals and Bolsheviks. On the other side, the war was seen as a fight between democracy and fascism. Meanwhile, public officials clung to official neutrality. Journalists and intellectuals flocked to Spain to cover the conflict, including such famous writers as Ernest Hemingway and George Orwell. Additionally, the growing use of radio, film, and photography meant the Spanish Civil War significantly changed media coverage. News of Americans in Spain fanned interest in the war, particularly in radical circles, and more Americans began to consider the possibility of enlisting in the Loyalist Army. While new and changing trends in journalism and media transformed how the public became aware of the events and reacted to them, the journalists them were themselves transformed by the experience. Paul Preston notes that there is a link between many of the writers and journalists who came to Spain and the thousands of men and women from all around the world who flocked to join the international brigades. To be sure, not every reporter who went to Spain was a radical Republican sympathizer or even particularly political. However, as a result of what they saw, even some of those who arrived without commitment came to embrace the cause of the beleaguered republic. As stated previously, attitudes towards the Spanish Civil War would be tied largely to economic and social divisions. According to F.J. Taylor, Gallup reports revealed that 76% of Americans held favorable opinions of the Loyalists. Religion was an important factor in which side received someone's sympathies. The Catholic Church leadership in America was very pro-nationalist and opposed any aid to the Republic. Polling conducted by the American Institute of Public Opinion revealed that four out of ten Catholics sympathized with Franco and the Nationalists. While the number is certainly higher than average, it's noteworthy that despite the pro-nationalist views of church leadership and hierarchy, less than half of Catholics agreed. Certainly, factors such as union membership, immigration background, and class interest were influential within the opinions of the American Catholic population. The Catholic leadership was not the only faction in the United States that was sympathetic to the Nationalists. Certain capitalist elements refused to trade with the Republican government, while others actively aided the Nationalist side. With oil, vehicles, and other products not classified as military products under the Neutrality Act, certain corporations took advantage of the situation. One example is the Texas Oil Company, now known as Texaco, which did business with the Spanish nationalists. The Texas Oil Company delivered nearly 2 million tons of oil on long-term credit and without guarantees between 1936 and 1939. In addition to oil, the Nationalists were provided 12,000 trucks from Ford, Studebaker, and General Motors, along with 40,000 bombs from du DuPont sent via Germany. In 1945, the Undersecretary at the Spanish Foreign Ministry, José María de Seninga, admitted that without American petroleum and American trucks and American credit, we could have never won the Civil War. In addition to actual material aid from these corporate interests, the Nationalists received further help from the policy of neutrality of the American government and its practical impact. Further, some leading figures of America First isolationism, such as Charles Lindbergh and Henry Ford, were notorious for their pro-fascist views and contact with the fascist governments. 
Despite the official neutrality of the government and the presence of pro-nationalist factions, American involvement in the Spanish Civil War is probably best known for the aid and volunteerism of ordinary citizens on behalf of the Spanish Republic. Both men and women from a variety of ethnicities and beliefs worked to prevent the spread of fascism. Some traveled all the way to Spain, some never returned. Whether they signed up for the Abraham Lincoln Brigades or were back home fundraising, pro-Republican Americans showed an especially strong sense of internationalism and solidarity. Activists and volunteers connected to the Republican movement had diverse motivations and ideologies. There's been some effort, especially by the right, to portray those who were involved as Stalinists taking orders straight from the Comintern. While there is no dispute that Stalin, the Soviet Union, and Comintern aligned parties and organizations were heavily involved and active, the activists themselves cannot be pigeonholed. As Rosenstone noted, it is necessary to bury some of the shibboleths of Cold War years and to remember that dissidence in the United States occurs in response to perceptions of reality on this side of the Atlantic, and not because of the wishes of men in the Soviet Union. Just like the Spanish Republicans themselves, Americans who opposed the spread of fascism were not homogenous. Typically, they hailed from militant sections of the working class or the radical intelligentsia. Most had some experience in the political left and in working class organizations and unions, whether it was the Communist Party, CPU, CPUSA, that was aligned with Moscow, or the traditionally anarchist union, the Industrial Workers of the World, IWW. This period saw the height of influence by the CPUSA in American politics, as well as the widespread support of the Popular Front tactic. Indeed, the men who went to Spain came out of a radical subculture that emerged in the era of the Depression and the New Deal, which was an era of massive labor organizing. The Nationalist Rebellion in Spain, backed by Mussolini's Italy and Hitler's Germany, served to represent not just injustice in general, but an opportunity to fight it. In reference to African-American volunteers, Robin D.G. Kelly claims the conflict that they were joining was, in fact, much more than a struggle against fascism. It was several wars rolled up in one. But this applied to many of the volunteers. To the African American, Spain was a way to fight for Ethiopia, as well as racial justice and equality in the United States. To the Jew, Spain was a way to fight Nazism. To the various European immigrants, Spain was a way to fight the growth of fascism that had taken over so many of their native countries. Spain came to symbolize the fight for justice across the globe and was commonly seen as a fight between democracy and fascism. While the reality is certainly more nuanced and the idealism of the time might seem naive to some, it was the idea and perception of what the struggle in Spain meant that galvanized people in America and elsewhere. A wide variety of aid and relief organizations were formed during the war. These organizations sought to raise funds, gather non-military supplies, and increase pro-Republican opinions. Additionally, these groups attempted to raise awareness of the embargo and hoped to pressure the government into lifting it. While these relief agencies were not able to affect government policy, they did provide some assistance to Republican forces. The three most active and important such organizations were the North American Committee to Aid Spanish Democracy, the Spanish Societies to Aid Spain, and the Medical Bureau. The various aid groups reflected popular front tactics of the time. While the Communist Party certainly had dominant roles in many of them, the groups were still essentially alliances of various anti-fascist politics. Eric Smith's analysis points out that while communists were prevalent, there were various campaigns with various goals, and both leadership and membership ranged from li liberals to socialists to labor unionists to independents. While the relief groups failed to produce policy changes, they did manage to provide some modest material aid. 
While small, especially in comparison to the contributions of both military and non-military aid to nationalists from Italy and Germany, every little bit was certainly needed by the Republicans. The Medical Bureau was able to build eight hospitals in Spain and sent 59 ambulances, and sent 113 physicians, nurses, and ambulance drivers to staff the facilities provided. The aid was also helpful from a, from a morale standpoint, even if it was relatively minor materially. The international brigades were created in 1936 to recruit international volunteers to aid Republican forces. Though volunteers had arrived independently before its creation and would continue to throughout the conflict. Even when going through the brigades, the process was often chaotic. Travel to Spain was banned by many countries and carried with it the threat of jail time. An American medic named Hank Rubin recalled, there was no contract or agreement offered or signed as to the duration of our stay. William Herrick, another American volunteer, recalled similarly, my group had not been told there would be a time limitation, we just assumed it was for the duration. Volunteers were poorly equipped and received little to no training. Despite the extreme difficulties and risk, roughly 3,000 Americans traveled to Spain during the war. The 2,800 that joined the International Brigades became known collectively as the Abraham Lincoln Battalion or Brigade, though Americans served in other units as well as had separate units of their own, such as the John Brown Anti-Aircraft Battery. The International Brigades saw action early in the war, arriving in Madrid to help resist the siege. While the foreign volunteers arrived late in the battle, their bravery was commended and was said to have increased morale among Spanish Republican troops, leading to the usage of the brigadiers as shock troops. This tactic, combined with poor training and outdated faulty equipment, meant that the International Brigades sustained heavy casualties throughout their involvement in the war. Roughly one-third of the American Abe Lincolns that served throughout the war were killed in combat. The brigades had a large presence in the Battle of Harama, one of the bloodiest battles of the war that ended in relative stalemate. Brigadiers were heavily active in the Battle of Ebro, which was a disastrous defeat for Republican forces. In spring of 1938, the Republican government officially disbanded the international brigades, hoping to appease the non-intervention committee and convince Italy and Germany to withdraw their forces. However, neither withdrew their support of Franco, which helped them gain victory in April 1939. One of the remarkable aspects of the American experience in the Spanish Civil War is the partici participation of minorities. Two black women and 90 black men answered the call to defend the Spanish Republic. The American Lincoln Brigade was the first the Abraham Lincoln Brigade was the first non-segregated American military unit to ever exist. In fact, the unit was briefly commanded by an African American. Oliver Law had experience in the United States Army and became active in the Communist Party and various worker movements during the Great Depression. Due to previous experience as well as his performance in battle, Law was given command until he was killed in battle. More than 60 women traveled to Spain, and roughly one-third of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade were Jewish. African Americans experienced in Spain radically different racial treatment than they were used to in the United States. In many ways, the ethnic diversity of the International Brigade was representative of what they were trying to preserve and expand against the tide of reaction and fascism. While there was progress in terms of race, the brigades were still fairly conservative when it came to gender. Many veterans of the brigade continued fighting what they saw as the spread of fascism over democracy. Some returned to activism and radicalism upon returning home. Many served in World War II, once again facing Germans and Italians. However, veterans of the Spanish Civil War faced discrimination in the American Armed Forces 
often denied promotion or assigned to unimportant, non-combat jobs. Ironically, these surviving veterans were some of the most experienced in the new type of warfare and had seen up front the might of the Axis military machine. American participants in this conflict, however, were considered quote-unquote premature anti-fascist, something that perplexed veteran Bernard Knox. How, I wondered, could anyone be premature anti-fascist? Could there be anything such as a premature antidote to a poison, a premature septic, a premature antitoxin, a premature anti-racist? If you were not premature, what sort of anti-fascist were you supposed to be? This discrimination would only foreshadow the McCarthy era and the Red Scare of the Cold War, when Abraham Lincoln veterans would be targeted. Despite being heavily targeted, they attempted to keep the memory alive via the veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, which is still active today and runs the official archives of the brigade. There were splits among the Lincolns shortly after returning home from Spain. In 1939, the non-aggression pact between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany was signed. Many of the veterans supported the Communist Party's line on the agreement and sought to keep the United States out of the new war in Europe. Some noted that Stalin and the Soviets sought alliance with the Western democracies for years against the fascist powers, only to be abandoned time after time, as happened with France. However, the pact was unpopular among many leftists and alienated some of the Lincolns. Memories of the Moscow trials, the purges, and the repression and violence against anarchists, socialists, and other communists in Spain no doubt lowered the credibility of Stalinist groups. However, as noted above, the, the veterans were supportive of the war effort once World War II expanded, with the United States and Soviet Union coming together as allies. The legacy of the volunteers is mixed. Some see them as idealists. Others see them as Soviet pawns. Still others see the American volunteers as being ahead of their time in the fight against fascism. The selfless sacrifices of these ordinary men and women continue to be inspirational, particularly to young radicals around the world. In the current era of the Patriot Act, counterterrorism, and the National Security Agency, one has to wonder if an organization resembling the international brigades could ever exist again. We now know that the Franco regime was not explicitly fascist in the Italian sense and certainly not national socialist in the German sense. But its brutal suppression of dissent and civil liberties terrorized Spain for decades. United States support of the Franco regime in the post-World War II era of Cold War politics served to further drive in the dagger to those pro-Republican advocates. However, they did not fight and die in vain. The memory of their sacrifices and resistance continues to be one of the most fascinating aspects of the Spanish Civil War. As Hemingway beautifully eulogized, our dead live in the hearts and minds of the Spanish peasants, of the Spanish workers, of all the good, simple, honest people who believed in and fought for the Spanish Republic. The diverse attitudes and actions of Americans regarding the Spanish Civil War reflected the conflicting political, economic, and social divisions of the highly tumultuous American society at the time. The United States government and its commitment to isolationism and non-intervention failed to counter the growing fascist threat and joined the other Western democracies in watching Spain burn. The pro-nationalist elements in America reflected the growth of corporatism, traditionalism, nationalism, and fascism during the period, with the Great Depression rocking liberal capitalist societies to their core. Meanwhile, the pro-Republican sympathies of the public, as well as the movement to aid and volunteer for the Spanish Republic, reflected a time of class consciousness and radicalism among the American working class. The brave sacrifice, 
the radical possibilities, and the international solidarity will continue to be retold for generations. So as we wrap things up this morning, I did want to point out that there are veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade from Alabama. In fact, if you go to the official archives, the American Lincoln Brigade archives, um, which is still run by uh, the Veterans Organization. Unfortunately, there are no longer any living veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. I believe the last one passed away in 2016. But you can still see the legacy of their work, and I encourage you to check out the website, alba-valb.org. That's the official archives. And you can actually search up records and find folks from your home state. For example, type in Alabama, and you will find some very interesting characters who volunteered for the brigades. Um, for example, John Porter Hunter. He was from Bessemer, Alabama. Uh, he was a steel worker. He was not necessarily affiliated with any kind of party, any political movement. And he arrived in Spain in May of 1937. Unfortunately, um, he is believed to have been killed in battle. And he is just one of many examples. So that's an African-American gentleman from Bessemer, Alabama, who made it a point to f sail halfway across the world to fight for something bigger than himself. Uh, a couple of other interesting characters. Charles Howard Lewis, also an African-American gentleman who was born in Montgomery, Alabama. He was an active socialist, or a communist, actually. He was a member of the Workers' Alliance and had joined the Communist Party. Um, he sailed to Spain also in 1937, believed to have been killed in action in 1938. One that I found very interesting was Eduard McDaniels. He was born in Lumberton, Mississippi, uh, spent his childhood in Mississippi, uh, but eventually moved to San Francisco and then found his way all the way back into the South in Alabama when he returned to help organize the Alabama Sharecroppers Union. He sailed to Spain in 1937 and he actually managed to survive. He survived the war, served in World War II in the Merchant Marines in the U.S. Army, and he passed away in 1985. So I'll give you a couple of examples there just to kind of pique your interest, um, and I hope that you will check out the Abraham Lincoln Brigade archives. Uh, it's well worth your time just to... to you know, poke around the website, look up your records, look up your home state, whatever the situation may be. So I think, I think you got a little bit of an overview of the Spanish Civil War, what it was all about, how the United States played a role there. And I hope you came away with some understanding of why it's relevant to working people. This was a working class movement in Spain that provoked a counter-revolution of some of the nastiest, most evil forces our world has produced. And yet working people from the United States, from Alabama and Mississippi, but also from Canada and France and all over the world volunteered put their lives on the line for people they didn't even know because they believed in liberty, they believed in justice, they believed in solidarity. And I personally find that to be inspirational. All right, folks, so wrapping things up this morning, I did want to mention some excellent upcoming training opportunities from Labor Notes. Their May 2nd workshop is What to Do When Your Union Breaks Your Heart. 
Uh, as I mentioned before, it's one of those workshops that I hope you don't have to attend, but I really hope you will uh, if it's at all relevant for you. Uh, and not just for you, but perhaps for some of your other members, it may be a good conversation starter. If you're a union member, unfortunately, the chances are good that you've had or will have your heart broken at least once by one of your leaders. Whether you tried to get involved and there was nowhere to go, or the members got sold out, or leaders want to keep the union as their exclusive club, it can feel pretty harsh. In this workshop, we'll talk about how to recommit to your union and change the culture into one where leaders respect and serve the members. This workshop will be offered on a monthly basis. If you can't make it to this session, stay tuned for the next event. Uh, again, this is Tuesday, May 2nd. It will be from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Central Time, and it is online and free. And also in May, Labor Notes is doing its Secrets of a Successful Organizing uh, series. So the Secrets of a Successful Organizer book is very, very good. I highly recommend it. These trainings are based on that book. Uh, it is $15 for the entire series that takes place on May 3rd, 10th, and 17th. And they do ask that you attend all three workshops in the series. It takes place from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Central Time online. So go to labornotes.org to register. They'll send you the Zoom link. The first session is called Beating Apathy. The second session is called Assembling Your Dream Team. And the third session is called Turning an Issue into a Campaign. Even if you are not a labor union member, but you're at all interested in organizing, maybe community organizing, political organizing, or learning more about labor organizing so someday you can do it yourself, I uh, highly recommend this training series. Again, go to labornotes.org and you can find out all the details and register from there. Well, folks, that's it for the seventh episode of Shop Talk. Hope it was worth your time, and I really appreciate everyone listening. If you enjoyed it, please share with your network and make sure you're plugged into our work. Stay tuned to the Valley Labor Report on Saturday mornings starting at 9.30 a.m. Central, live on WVNN, YouTube, and Facebook. Please sign up for our email list at tvlr.fm, and don't forget to like, review, share, and subscribe. And finally... If you share our mission to grow the Southern labor movement, if you share our belief in the power of solidarity and collective organization, if you want media that is for working people, by working people, please consider becoming a recurring donor at tvlr.fm slash donate. All power to the workers. Solidarity, y'all.